dear colleagues, we are continuing our conference and the, the last uh, panel uh, with the fascinating title, uh, The How of the Now, Photographers Temporarily Revisited. Uh, and I'm glad to introduce our first speaker, Nancy Roth, uh, from the Journal of for Cultural Media and Theory Philosopher Studies. And Nancy, uh, Nancy is an art historian uh, who worked as an art and photography critic and as a curator and a lecturer. And in about uh, 2002, she uh, began to study the work of Czech-born philosopher and writer William Fuser. Uh, and she translated a few books uh, <clears throat> of his, uh, uh, three of his books, uh, and uh, is currently on the editorial board of Lucer Studies, uh, the Journal of Culture and Media Theory. Uh, please, and say, uh, 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 sorry, and the paper uh, is named Photography as Measurement, Exact Dimensions for Invented Realities. Uh, thank you very much, Olga. Um, I'm just want to say I'm really glad for a chance to, um, Try this out, I think we'd have to say. <laughs> Let me share my screen. We'll see if this works. This paper arose largely as an effort to fill in aspects of Willem Flusser's theory of photography. I could not really understand, but couldn't simply dismiss either things that seemed on the surface to be contradictory, but perhaps at another level were not. Among the most significant of these was Flusser's insistence that photography participated in the mathematizing of the world, the project of describing the world in numbers. Flusser always insisted that photographs quantify observations. Sometimes he said mathematize, and at least for a short time, he said document. He didn't adjust anything very much to accommodate the digital revolution. As far as he was concerned, photographs had always been composed of countable, calculable elements, whether molecules of silver salts or magnetically charged particles. Digital processes clarified and expedited what had always been possible. The countability, calculability of constituent particles are key features of his later writing about, quote, alternative worlds as well. In his thinking then, this drive to quantify, that is measure, flows smoothly into the drive to synthesize the world by means of algorithms. This paper will begin with some uh, discussion of measurement as such in general, then take up measurement in science in particular, and then following Flusser's own lead, come to the way measurement is discussed in physics. It will underscore two consistent understandings in his writing. The first is his identification of photography as the first technology to reach into the world of whirling particles, in quotes, below the level of human perceptibility and retrieve something that can, usually with considerable effort, be made perceptible to human beings. The second is his observation that such engagements always entail a reciprocity between the observer and the object of observation, measurer and measured. The conclusion will support his contention that photographs cannot be records of the past. Ooh. <laughs> Rather, they are designs or fantasies or perhaps better projections of future possibilities, in a sense, virtual realities. The phrase photography as measurement proposes that the camera is a modest piece of scientific apparatus, a mobile physics experiment in a way, measuring reflected light at one point in space-time and delivering the results to a viewer who, successfully or not, supplies a reality in which they are meaningful. Why do we measure at all? I'd like to suggest that measurement is the thin end of a drive to invent, fix, or just 
the first move towards some change in the status quo in what we perceive to be reality. We measure ourselves for new clothes, for medical treatments, for enhancements in appearance or performance. Uh, we measure spaces for excavations, planting, construction, or actions at a distance. We measure patterns of social behavior, voting, buying, killing, with the thought of changing them. Almost all such data is collected in a conviction that the measurer is independent of whatever is being measured, that the desired change will be achieved without any significant effect on the measurer. In familiar situations, this may seem still to be the case. In contemporary science, however, it's clear that at closer range, the measuring apparatus a person plus his or her measuring equipment is profoundly entangled with what is being measured. At about the time his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions was in press, the eminent science historian Thomas Kuhn gave a paper entitled The Function of Measurement in Modern Physical Science. In it, he examines and for the most part discredits some very common misunderstandings about measurement. But he also confirms an understanding that measurement relates to a particular theory. It is very rare for scientists to measure specifically in order to disprove a theory, he wrote. Measurements are rather undertaken when a scientist has particular expectations. The theory proposes general regularities about nature or reality. Measurement confirms them or doesn't for specific cases. Further, non-scientists tend to discount the enormous difficulty of measuring many natural phenomena. Not infrequently, the greatest achievement in a scientist's work is developing an apparatus suitable to the task at hand along with an understanding of the conditions under which it works, that is, actually collects legible data related to the theoretical context. Above all, Kuhn wants his audience to understand that the term measurement is not applicable to any kind of observation. Measurement delivers numbers. It makes specific individual instances comparable or potentially compatible, confirms or refutes a common ground. Still focused on the role of measurement in physical science, Kuhn points out that between about 1800 and 1850, measurement, a term that's gradually beginning to seem equivalent to quantification, became integral to virtually every branch of natural science. He suggests we think of this broad drive toward quantification as a second scientific revolution, equal in scope and impact to the first in the 17th century. If pressed to pinpoint a date for this second revolution, he wrote, he would suggest 1840. In an exceptional essay that concludes the collection Photography and Its Origins, the photography historian Kelly Wilder has examined John Herschel's studies of light. This work coincides almost exactly with the date Kuhn suggests for the scientific, second scientific revolution. And suddenly I feel like mentioning it coincides with the invention of photography pretty exactly as well. Wilder helpfully clarifies many points, but one is particularly relevant for present purposes. Oops. Herschel was working firmly within a scientific tradition. Specifically, he was addressing an anomaly in Isaac Newton's theory of light. He had already shown that the spectrum was longer than Newton's theory anticipated. Herschel discovered light beyond the visible spectrum by using a prism to separate colors, then measuring the temperature of each band. He called the band that was beyond the red band 
infrared. Daguerre's discovery, oops, I got ahead of myself. Daguerre's discovery was announced in 1839 and was soon followed by the specifics of Fox Talbot's different but related process. Daguerre was in the entertainment business rather than in science and Fox Talbot in his own description was looking for a way to save himself the trouble of laboriously drawing landscapes or botanical specimens or Assyrian artifacts. Neither was studying light in the sense that Herschel was. In fact, neither was attached to any particular proposition about reality as Kuhn helpfully described it. Their priority was an immediately perceptible result. One might say that science as a set of institutions with a firmly epistemological interest was suddenly facing results that had an overwhelmingly aesthetic effect on everyone. Or to put it another way, there was suddenly an astonishingly precise answer without a clear question. The experimental result, the photograph, did not seem to need explanation, interpretation. The camera had the look of an advanced measuring instrument, but what was it measuring? With notable exceptions in science and medicine, possibly forensics, maybe some journalism, there is nothing in place to stop a viewer from reading the image within whatever theoretical framework might come to mind. I found that I can grasp this idea most readily in the area of domestic photography, family snaps. A viewer without a theory, that is, without a framework developed in sustained experience of that family, quickly begins to scan the image for hooks into his or her own memories and associations. And it, almost seems like a natural defense against the threat of meaninglessness. Slisser comes closest to identifying photography as physical measurement in an essay called The Gesture of Photographing from 1975. In the following passage, he speaks of photographing very much as phys physicists speak of measurement. He even mentions Heisenberg. Here's a quotation from that essay. The fact that the photographer manipulates the situation does not mean that the photograph cannot be an objective Im image. Still less does it mean that the image would have been more objective if the photographer had refrained from manipulating the situation. Nor does it mean that the objectivity, objectivity sorry, of the photograph is affected in any way if the motif reacts to being manipulated by the photographer. On the contrary, it means that to observe a situation is to manipulate it. Or to put it another way, observation changes the observed phenomenon. To observe the situation is to be changed by it. Those who observe the gesture of photographing need neither Heisenberg's uncertainty theory nor psychoanalytic theory. They can actually see it. The photographer cannot help manipulating the situation. His very presence is manipulation and he cannot avoid being manipulated by this situation. He is changed simply by being there. Such a reciprocity lies at the heart of Karen Barad's book, Meeting the Universe Halfway. A particle physicist and a committed feminist, Barad treats all kinds of serious inquiry, inquiries with truth claims in terms of experiment, not only in quantum physics, but in the history of philosophy, of science, sociology, and more. She dwells for some time on Foucault's discourse analysis, expressing deep admiration but also an unwillingness to accept the restriction of the key concept discourse to language alone. She insists on the materiality of discourse. A quick, but I hope fair summary might be matter matters. 
The identities of experimenter and experimented upon of measuring apparatus and measured object may not be assumed, she insists, rather they must be produced after the results of the experiment are available and a very complete precise account of the experimental arrangements has been made. A report containing details of who was involved, when, where, with what intentions, expectations, interruptions, surprises, etc. The entities, agents and objects are always entangled. That is, changes in one correspond to changes in another. From a sufficiently thorough and accurate account, however, we can separate, her word is usually cut, the identity of the inquiring apparatus apart and further cut the, the apparatus from the object of the experiment. Underpinning Barad's position, she calls it agential realism, is the physics philosophy of Niels Bohr the Danish physicist who was instrumental in setting out the principles of quantum physics, mainly in the 1930s. Barad reiterates Bohr's insistence <clears throat> that we participate in the reality we study. Objectivity cannot be assumed. It must be asserted and earned, specifically by coming clean about the experimental arrangements about human experience as part of the experiment. Barad examines one example of materiality of discourse in some detail. Let me see if I can get this there. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, Barad examines one example of the materiality of discourse, um, namely sound tomography, specifically as it is used to see a living human fetus before it is born. She insists that nothing can be assumed beforehand about the identities involved in these arrangements. There is no self-evident way to separate subject from object of inquiry or to definitively assign the function of the apparatus to one or the other. The prospective parents are not likely to see themselves as producing the image, at least not to the same extent as obstetrician or technician might. The almost baby is arguably the agent instigating and controlling the whole performance. Flusser would probably very, would very probably insist that the designer of the tomography apparatus be designated the producer of the image. Such cuts, in any case, substantially affect the meaning of the image. Flusser's writing on photography tends towards sweeping generality with an exasperating absence of specific examples. Still, However loosely he drew the borders of photography per se, he's always talking about images made with apparatuses, always aware of them as quantifications and always insisting that they are projections, in a sense, fictions. In contrast to Bart's resonant paraphrase of a, of a photograph's message, this has been, Flusser seems to say, this is possible. I have not resolved the, the questions that Flusser raised, even to my own satisfaction. But at least for me, a photograph takes on an unfamiliar solemnity or mystery when regarded as the result of an experiment, a measurement of light at a specific point in space time. Whether the device in question be small and portable like the one installed on your phone or vast multiple and networked like the photographic equipment on Percy, NASA's new Mars rover, a photograph is a deliberate physical inquiry by human beings into the stuff of reality, into matter. It becomes an occasion to wonder all over again how and why people decide to set up such experiments 
on what grounds anyone decides whether they've worked or not, and what meanings were justified in drawing from them. There are those who doubt the seriousness of Flusser's interest in photography. They suspect that his real interest lay in the broader pat pattern of technological change that had led by the time of his death in 1991 to alternative worlds on computer screens. He didn't use the phrase virtual reality. That was coined at just about the same time in the early 1990s by Jaron Lanier. Lanier was among the first to develop virtual reality systems commercially, and he has quite a lot to say about measurement. Any system that addresses human perception with sufficient precision to seem real, he writes, begins with and largely depends on its tracking system. It must establish the coordinates that determine the temporal and spatial relationships a user will perceive. Trackers are not only the critical fulcrums that allow VR displays to work at all, he writes, they also measure people so they can turn into avatars for one another. VR is more a science of measurement than of synthesis. Between 1984 and 1988, Flusser was in fairly regular contact with the photographer Juan von Cuberta. In their correspondence, whoops, I think I needed to go forward one. Lindsay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have slightly out of time, just like eight, two minutes uh, we have. Can I have one sentence? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, uh, between 1984 and 1988, Flusser was in fairly regular contact with the photographer Juan von Cuperta. In their correspondence is a phrase that marked a point of agreement between them and perhaps can serve as a conclusion. Photography documents things that do not exist. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have a few minutes for brief uh, questions and comments, and then we, we will have the 30 minutes for the comment discussion. But now, if somebody have uh, the short questions, clarifying. Well, uh, Aksana Gavrishna uh, has a question, please. Uh, I apologize, I can't hear. Okay, yes, uh, it's uh, just um, the, the sound was blocked. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, I have a comment, but which I think it's very important. And perhaps uh, if we look at measurement, uh, not as measuring uh, real objects, but uh, the this potential for compatibility of things or comparing things. So what photography does is not necessarily uh, measure specific uh, uh, objects in space, but it establishes the rules how we can compare similar objects. And I think that your photograph with the family is a very good example of it. So when we uh, look at a family, um, we have a foundation sort of to compare it with other ideas of family visually. So I think uh, if we look at measurement from this point of view, it really has a, I think, a very, very fruitful um, potential. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have uh, two other questions. Uh, Jennifer Trucker, please. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for this paper. I was really uh, I was interested in your um, your integration of Karen Barad's work, whose um, whose work is also of, of a lot of interest um, to us in science and technology studies. One of the things that um, you know that I, that uh, about her work that seems really uh, 
very fruitful for thinking about photography, which you, you I think touch on is the way that she's um, critically reworking Judy Butler's influential theory of performative, uh, of performativity. I mean, in the way that in Barad is, mm -hmm. is um, you know, revealing how questions about nature and culture interact and change over time to be uh, misguided in a way. And so she's drawing on performativity theory. And I thought with, with Flusser too, whose work I know less well, but um, you touched on the, the aspects, the creative gesture of photography, the, this, um, uh, you know, um, link over to kind of conceptual or performative approaches to photography. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about whether or not you think in addition to measurement, I mean, if, is, are there, you know, thinking about agential realism, does your account of agential realism in relation to photography um, open up a space for thinking about um, performative approaches to photography that perhaps um, we need to consider? Can I just say yes? <laughs> I think it does open up, yeah, it opens up all kinds of spaces for me. I, um, oops. I'm not sure I, uh, You're audible. It's, I am audible. We can hear, we can hear you, yes. Oh. Oops, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, Nancy, maybe, maybe if you stop sharing your screen, we can uh, see um, uh, more, people, <laughs> more people on the screen at the same time. Um, if you can- Stop share? Yes, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have another question from uh, Winfred, uh, please. Have Can you hear me? Because I had a, a strange uh, note on my on my desktop. But if you hear me, it's okay. Yeah. Um, it's it's more or less just a remark. Measurements makes images operative. Are you interested in operativeness and in the history of operativeness? Uh, so maybe it begins with a, a, an article. I don't know. It's not the beginning, but it's interesting to think about. Uh, um, Alan Secula's remarks on Edward Steichen at war. I don't know if you if you know that uh, article. It's about a long time the, ago. The, the, <laughs> yeah, I believe <laughs> it's it's a, it's an old article, but it's interesting how images were made. He 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 thought instrumental uh, today. We would say I think uh, operative in the context of measured images. Is, is, is this somehow in, of interest for you? Or is I haven't thought about it. I haven't oh, thought okay. about it so far. <laughs> Sorry. No, no problem. It just uh, pushed me, so. Yeah, no, because... it's, it's interesting. Yeah. And it was just a remark, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you so much, but uh, we have to go further. And uh, well, as uh, Winfried already asked the questions and I now I should introduce him. Uh, glad to introduce the next speaker, uh, Winfried Gerling from the University of Applied St Sciences, Potsdam. Uh, Winfried is a professor for concepts and aesthetics of new media in the joint program European Media Studies and the University of Applied Studies and the University of Potsdam. Uh, since 2018, he is a member of research uh, college Sensing the Knowledge of Sensitive Media. He is also a member of the Directorate of the Brandenburg Center for Media Studies. And his uh, recent publication includes the contribution to this year book, Versatile Concordus, looking at the GoPro movement, and the article Photography in the Digital, the Screenshot and In-Game Photography, published in the Compendium Photographies in 2010. He is also co-author of two books published in German, such as Sharing Images, Photographic Practices in Digital Culture, and What the Case is, precarious choreographies on the image of failing men in photography and art. Uh, and the paper is called A Sense of Co-Presence. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I start uh, with uh, sharing my screen. I hope this will work. Is it okay? Can you see only one screen with one text and nothing yes. else? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so thanks a lot, Olga, for the introduction and all, to all the others for the invitation to speak here. I will take the opportunity to give a lecture which is close connected to the book which I edited with Florian Krautkremer, Versatile Camcorders, looking at the GoPro movement. The topic has been haunting me for some time and has interested me particularly in the aspect of the connection of cameras, bodies, environment, uh, and digital networks and the associated risky production of I images. Here, among other things, I was interested in what the technolo technological unconsciousness, unconscious could be. That will hardly play a role today. I will try to narrow down the development of the camera as the action cam, which produces a special kind of view, which I call the, com the companion view. I will start with a look. Oh, so, sorry, I, I forgot something. I have to start the screen sharing again because I forgot to turn on uh, the sound because I wanted to say uh, to, to screen a video. So you have to have the sound. Um, I will start uh, with a look on the first scripted advertisement GoPro ever produced in 2016, and I hope it will work. Is this it work? being in the moment? Fred, we see, uh, um, is this okay, hanging out? See it on full screen. And is this really playing with your kid? We only see it in a section. Don't stop what you're doing to capture what you're doing. Keep running. You... Keep playing. Keep. Sorry, can, couldn't you see anything? Well, we could see it just on just a small section of the screen, not the full screen. If you maybe can uh, enlarge oh. it to full screen. <laughs> and it was yeah. not a video, but it was yeah, a still image. It was still image. And found. Is Does this it work now? being in the moment? No. It's it's still a still image. Is this hanging yeah. out? And is this really yeah. playing with your kid? Don't stop what you're doing to capture what you're doing. Doesn't work. Mm -mm. Unfortunately, not really. <laughs> right? To, what did oh. you do last time when it worked? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, um, it, it's always the same problems. I don't know why. Maybe is, I, I tried to do it again. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to desktop two. Can you now see it, it now? Yes. Is this okay? Then I moment? leave it that way. Mm -hmm. Is this hanging out? And is this really playing with your kid? Don't stop what you're doing to capture what you're doing. Keep running, keep playing, keep dancing. Just keep doing. GoPro, start recording. Oops, sorry. Um, this ad shows at best what I mean by companion view. The camera is not between the photographer and the action, but with or him, with her or him, and mediates a form of co-presence. The GoPro was designed for people uh, that like action sports, which are sometimes risky. With the, st with the first stagnation in sales, GoPro management recognized that they were liked by a much larger community that didn't own the camera. These people liked the videos and the gesture of risk in them, but they didn't know why they should buy a camera like this. And so an audience, audience was addressed with this ad that was not predominantly involved in sports or extreme sports, but was parents with children, couples, traveling people who were just having fun, etc. The GoPro was supposed to become the universal camera worn on the body no longer standing between the user and the motive, thus also distinguishing it from the smartphone. At the same time, the company changed its slogan from GoPro be a hero into GoPro capture and share your world. This is a change from heroic self-representation in the sense of a selfie to a view that is the view of something or someone who is with the photographer. Share your, your world means to be with and in the action. Feeling like one is in the moment and at the same time knowing that this moment is being recorded by the attached camera is as, as important as the action itself. It is a, 
third-person view, which was established with computer games. With Philip Beda, quote, instead of trying to convey the subjective experience of the character, which could, which would promote the vicarious identification of the player or viewer, the third-person view moves outside of the character and places him or her in relation to the surrounding environment, quote end. The GoPro has lastingly changed the conditions for making images by conceiving the body and the device as a jointly acting unit. The device is small, robust, mobile, and can be used in a variety of ways, usually attached to the body or a piece of sports equipment. It is hard to imagine any other, another technology that so thoroughly and effectively stages the connection of media production and its aesthetics to Recording the environment. Stopped. Recording in progress. Uh, sorry. To the environment in which is, it was created. The presumed self staging of users is therefore always also a staging of technology, which is skillfully, skillfully utilized by the brand for its distribution purposes. The development of this device, which is relatively simple in terms of technology, but conceptually unique, gave rise, much like the iPhone, to its own culture and aesthetics, a culture that connected making images with action, thus producing a direct relationship between media production, technology, and life. The initial co uh, conception of GoPro arose from the need of surfing founder Nicholas D, which you can see here, Wood, Nicholas D. Woodman, to develop a camera that functions well or even at all in circumstances that are technologically hostile to the use of conventional cameras. Surfing and the difficulty of conveying this experience through media present an occasion for thinking about small, a small waterproof and easy to use camera that works and can be operated in the context of sports activities, or better yet, that does not have to be operated at all. Bradford Schmidt, a friend of Woodman's and later an employee of GoPro, describes the reason behind this idea as follows, quote, although I, it had been a surf trip, any pictures of myself actually surfing were conspicuously absent. I had traveled alone, so all the shots were limited to perfect waves without a surfer in sight taken from the beach before I paddled out. The photos felt strangely empty considering the euphoria I didn't exp I'd experienced riding the waves. He implicitly, he implicitly formulates two important concepts for the development of the GoPro. On the one hand, the, to convey something that can presumably uh, only be experienced by a few people, and on the other, this difficulty of the environmental conditions under which such cameras would need to function. The mode of being there as Wolfgang Hagen has called it in the context of smartphone photography is as essential as showing extraordinary experiences in an often spectacular nature. The GoPro in its development is close to the body and yet it conveys a view from outside which does not simulate the view of the photographer. As a symptom, the first GoPros didn't have a viewfinder or a display. It is meant to testify to the fact that its wearers were there, while at the same time the viewers are meant to imagine them themselves in the images, in the image as a form of mediated corporal presence. In a very short introduction and the development of the GoPro, I will establish the singularity of the GoPro and the, by extension with the action cam in general. I will concentrate on the apparatus as a technological object. The first GoPro is an analog 35 millimeter camera with a 28 millimeter wide angle lens which, lens, which cannot be focused. It comes with a waterproof case and an essential gadget, a strap that can be used to attach the camera to the arm. The development of the camera starts from a usage area that to this day tends to be served by semi-professional cameras such as the Nikonos. The Nikonos entered production as the direct sex, uh, successor uh, to the Calypso, which was in, developed by Jacques-Yves Cousteau, uh, the famous uh, biologist. 
These were amphibian cameras protected from water, dust and rust. No external case was necessary. This, is, this distinguished them from all other underwater cameras at that time. Although they were developed as an underwater camera, they were referred to, uh, to as all weather cameras and were quickly implemented in other damp, sandy and muddy conditions, such as those of the rainforest. They were, for instance, often used for surfing and sailing, but were also deployed in the Vietnam War. Koichi Sevada, a Japanese photographer who worked in the Vietnam War, called it the workhorse of the war. And for further quotation, if they ever develop it to the point where you can load it fast and use longer lenses with it, it will become the basic camera of photojournalism. I show here some uh, photographs of, of some old photographs of the uh, Nikon NOS and also here you can see the camera itself. Due to its uh, construction, the Nikonos camera is well suited to use in, in environments that would be inaccessible to other cameras, thus creating unconventional perspectives such as those we know today from the GoPro. Basically, the Nikonos could be the veritable predecessor of the GoPro in particular as to its versatility and fields of application. But what seems to interest Woodman, the uh, founder of GoPro, more in the first development of the GoPro is not so much the camera itself as the freedom it gives its users from having to hold them actively in their hands. And this does not directly follow from the relatively elaborate camera technology of the Nikonos. The essential quality of the GP Hero is the strap around the arm, which can be seen in the fact that one consideration during the prototype uh, phase was to develop a case with a strap that could hold a variety of cameras. The special quality of the first GP Hero is therefore that it is attached to the body and small enough not to get in the way. It is simply there and so other forces affect the camera and the image it creates than when using conventional cameras with viewfinders. As Julian Jochmering succinctly states in our book, the swamp itself should be filmed or photographed, or in this case, the wave. The influence of the environment becomes an essential factor of this form of photography. The moving environment of the GoPro is the condition for producing an image since it exerts influence over the image. It is a significant component of the aesthetics of image production simply due to the fact that the camera is there in the world and is exposed to it just like the body that carries it. At any rate, the camera shows up here as simultaneously influenced, mutually conditioned by the carrier and the environment. Gravity has the same effect onto the camera, on the camera as it does to the body that carries it. The only decision made by the person is to wear the camera in the first place and in what situation. The GoPro shows itself to be resistant to an aesthetics that has been established since the Renaissance and which is meant to approximate, which is meant to approximate human sight in which the picture horizon always provides a firm foundation. This aesthetics of central perspective leads to a transparency of the medium that is meant to disappear behind. It seems as if there were no apparatus or technology and as if, as if, there, if the very possibility of the image had always come from a decided, self-determined, although highly conventionalized stance or position of the person toward the world against all opposition. GoPro pictures pre present this opposition by initially privileging the camera's moving undirected position toward the world and showing a gaze rather than a view. Pictures emerge deliberately by accident as the influence of the user's movement with the camera, which can create something not intended. Like you can see here in the screenshots of a, uh, of a video where a uh, windshield user is crashing into a, a rock. 
but he didn't die. So um, perspectives that with a new vision a mu movement of the beginning of the 20th century were still being created in a consciously revolutionary sense as technically inspired. And I show just a few images of Willy Ruge's first um, fall with a parachute, which is really an interesting uh, photo series. And I, I really enjoy this image so much, but I can't talk too much about that. The versatility of the GoPro is the basis for the device rela device's relationship as an image producing machine to the body its environment and the social technological embeddedness that inseparably links the activity of the body and its surroundings with producing and processing images. GoPro managed to construct a mass media ecosystem that will turn GoPro into its own content network. This is a, a quote by um, Marty Biancuzzo from Wall Street Daily. The entire production and communication runs over popular science media, uh, social media channels, and users are already familiar with how to use them. The ecosystem that GoPro has constructed over the course of time, therefore facilitates, facilitates a unique connection between the device, the GoPro with its specific features and bodies, action surroundings, and uh, ubiquitous mobile smart computing environments and their worldwide networking. While the smartphone has seen to the rise uh, of a culture of image sharing and distribution generating the particular aesthetics of the selfie and a, a certain immediacy of participation, GoPro has joined in with this culture of sharing, focusing on the cooperation between the device and the body in action and thus creating a specific perspective that puts the device and the subject into the scene at the same time. This is meant to give the viewers of these distributed images the feeling of taking part, of being close to the action which is recorded, being there. The unique spatial temporality of photographic mediality, which has been described by Roland Barthes as an illogical, to quote, an illogical conjunction between the here and now and the there and then, quote, end, is even more strongly displaced in the direction of a mediated co-presence, -pres which is conveyed over spatial distance. The here of the person photographing is connected to the there of the observer, and the time now is abolished as a separating factor. This is amplified by the possibility of live streaming, and then I have to go a little further in my... By the uh, possi possibility of live streaming, it takes on a tragic significance with the streaming of a text like the one in Christchurch. It is significant that the camera is never positioned on one of these mounts between the gaze of the user and what is being recorded. It is more or less on the side of the user and shares the same space, especially when filming with several cameras. Uh, for the GoPro picture, it is true that there cannot or should not be a decision against the presence of the self in the picture. The camera with a fisheye mounted on the body and thus the body is almost always part of the visual space being recorded. The space in front or behind the camera is dismissed in favor of its accompanying activity. The camera becomes the user's companion. Perspectives arise that a human eye could never see. see. Although the intentional integration of the, this camera companion in the space or on the body of the self can be presumed it would be a form of the selfie, I assume, made by delegating to the technology pictures of an environment that records itself. The selfie of an environment which is not only which not only consists of the camera, but of other bodies, surroundings, hardware, software, networks, and social media. In, in his text for our book, Jan Dieselmeier calls this kind of picture Videt. It sees. Expanding on this, uh, this one might say the environment it sees itself. 
this side or vision as a distancing of a kind of seeing centered on the human being has justifiably be been described as non-human decentered and distributed vision by Joanna Zielinska. Human side, however, should not be pitted against mechanical side. Um, rather, she wants to, quote, position the human as part of a complex assemblage of perception in which various organic and machinic agents come together and apart for functional, political, or aesthetic reasons, quote, end. The embedding of the photographic device in a ubiquitous and smart computing environment had been unique and has relied on a technological environment that only become, became established in the last decade and a half. In this environment, there is no longer a photographer who takes a picture to show it to others. Image production consists of a complex relationship between conscious and intentional decision decisions and a technological unconscious, whose condition is the network machines bound to bodies. What becomes visible in the end or what gets attention is also determined cybernetically, normalized by means of automatic, automatic image processing in the camera and defined as interesting by algorithms in the net. The images produced with a GoPro are always also images of described environments, what usually remains in the off space of the image becomes visible. For instance, the cameras worn by other participants are recorded when recordings are made in the group or when several cameras are worn on the body of the person recording. These images are then the visible part of a self-referential techno-collective environment, which produces a unity of this complex technological body and its perception. Coming back to the ad of the beginning of my talk, a new audience was addressed with this ad that was not predominantly involved in sports or extreme sports, but was parents with children, couples traveling, people who were just having fun. The, the GoPro was supposed to become the universal camera worn on the body and no longer standing between the user and the motive. The clip first shows people always with a smartphone in their hands to take photos asking, is this really in the moment? And is this really playing with your kids in order then to show images that were taken with a GoPro that do not interrupt or dominate uh, the action to say, keep playing, keep dancing, just keep doing. The GoPro does not stand between the person and the action being recorded, taking a photo whenever it's wanted, supported by the voice control that was introduced in 2016. In the images, and I'm coming close to the end, uh, of the GoPro or other action cams, an image of the environment, the body and the camera is created, which generates the mode of co-presence, even with a viewer who in this culture is thought as independent from the view of the so-called photographer. In the images of the GoPro or other action cams, an image of the environment, the body and the camera is created, which generates a mode of co-presence also, also with the viewer, which in this culture is thought to be independent of the gaze of the so-called photographer. The development of the GoPro can be described as a discontinuous continuity which barely cultivated conceptual uses from previous developments, such as the Nikonos. Perhaps the GoPro in its genesis as a technological object does not all belong to the species of camera. The GoPro as a technology, much like the smartphone, has generated a special view to the world, which I refer here somewhat tentat tentatively as the view of a companion technology which mediates a form of this co-present. This view is that of an interplay between many agents and de a decidedly non-human view. The environment films, photographs, the strap wrist is broken and the GoPro goes where you want and goes where you can. Thank you. And this is a little advertisement for our new group. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Winfred. Uh, please stop sharing your screen. Uh, stop so sharing, we'll yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, just a few minutes for brief questions, but still we have uh, some time. Uh, does anybody want to ask something? Sana. Sana. <clears throat> Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, what I want to ask is really fascinating, but um, so what, what's the interest um, for the viewer? We, we can understand um, you know, that the owner um, is quite interested how, how this companion is seeing what he ex or she experiencing. But uh, for the viewer who is not actually involved in the action, or what is his or her um, position with this uh, camera. Um, how how do you see it? And and, and in addition to it, if do you think it's um, at all uh, connected? Um, the um, very popular now sort of uh, visual experiences is um, which having to do with um, uh, desktop so-called de desktop movies is when uh, people are looking at other people saying playing computer games or other people doing something. And, and so you, as a viewer, you sort of share and even bodily uh, the experience of another person. So that, that's our uh, two questions or connected questions. Thank uh, you. Uh, sorry, that, that are really two very large questions, especially the second one, because I'm, I'm working on a book uh, uh, which is uh, called Screen Images. And we, we are really thinking about uh, screenshots and uh, and um, um, movies which were made with a screen, also documentaries were made with a screen, and it's uh, it's it, it's really strange because it's different to the GoPro. I think it's someone it's somehow like if there's another force taking your desktop. If you watch the movies on your desktop, it's really strange because it moves you away to 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 somewhere to someone or something else which you can't control. But you have the the uh, imagination of this is my desktop. So there's a. I, I don't think that there is such a big connection between the two images. But I maybe have to think about that further. And the other thing is um, the the um, the viewer. I think it's 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 the same interest uh, like if you are on a, on a concert and you send uh, an image to a friend and say. Yeah, look here. I, I'm now. I'm here now. And I, I would you? It would be so nice if you b will be part of that or something like that. And and uh, with the GoPro images or images like that, which are made with a technol technology te technology, uh, which gives you the feeling that you be present in the image. There's a huge difference to smartphone photography, and it's it's the the mode of being with maybe and not being there or something like that. And and also it is uh, related to Bart what uh, Nancy just said <laughs> that has been is maybe it is just so, and it's <laughs> it, it is I, I think the feeling of being connected is uh, one of the, um, yeah, uh, given um, value, excuse me, profit, a value, profit. profit. Yeah, yeah, value. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I lose words also in German. So uh, thanks a lot for the question. Maybe Jen, I, I thought, I think Jennifer was the next, but I'm not the moderator. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we'll have uh, just a very few time, a short question, short answer. Go ahead. Jennifer. Jennifer. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think um, with this, this is very interesting to think about um, from the point of view of the viewer, because when I was looking at those videos, to me, this is also very much about performance of a certain kind of self. Because, you know, uh, as you know, I mean, extreme sports tend to be much more solitary than popular traditional sports. Um, and they differ, you know, because they have highly un uncontrollable variables. So, you know, it's, is it also about, in a way, a performance of a kind of a person? It's a rugged camera for a rugged person who throws themselves off cliffs or, you know, surfs. It's basically, to me, it's less about, it, it seems like less about, um, you know, uh, 
it is performance of co-presence, but partly because the people who buy these cameras are mostly alone when they're doing these things. And also, you know, the kind of, so to me, I was curious if you are, you know, the human, the agent, the, the technical body, these are very generic terms, but in terms of who actually is buying them, you know, I was curious if you think that there's a, um, you know, a kind of a, um, you know, what kind of a, a theory of the self or what kind of new kind of person is this being marketed to? And the fact that, you know, in terms of the, the capitalist um, mass marketing of this now to parents to play on their guilt, like now you're supposed to record it, but not look like you're doing it. <laughs> you know, I was very curious about how you see gender and theories of the self in relation. And it might be a, for a question for later, it might be too uh, broad, but it just, you know, that was what came to mind to me. Oh no, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. There are a lot of, of um, performative aspects in, in these videos which are close connected to, which I uh, said in the beginning, to risky action loaded images which present the, the maker of the image as, as a male, usually. Uh, which is uh, in a very risky action, like like the um, uh, um, the wingsuit uh, guys or, or something like that. But but there there was, and that what what uh, that that uh, what was what I was trying to tell with this lecture. There was a change in also the marketing of the GoPro because since 2016 they never did a scripted ads. It was always produced by the users, the, the advertisements of GoPro. There was never something like, uh, it wasn't necessary, but because it was sold to the people who, who used it. And it, it came that they didn't make any profit anymore. And they had to think about the people who liked these images. And then they had to sell it to other people. And so they, they were looking for people like, I, I said, like families and and so on, and somehow it changed also the image of the GoPro. But it's, there are so many different kinds of images. You can also look at GoPro at war, which is close connected to to uh, game aesthetics, because there are also people wearing it in a sense of aggressive shooting moments and things like that, which are really connected to the game aesthetics, but uh, they, they also open another space of uh, complex relationships, which I can't uh, answer in, a, in two, two or three, three minutes. So sorry for that, but maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, thank you so much, Winfried, and thank you all for the discussion. I hope we will have the time for common uh, discussion uh, later. So, and now it is time to uh, hand it over to our next uh, speaker. Yeah, I'm glad to introduce uh, <coughs> Chris Belgian Adams, uh, uh, who is an associate professor of uh, art history at the University of Mississippi, and uh, she specialized in the history and theory of photography. Uh, she is also the author of the book Photography, Temporality, Modernity, Time Warped, published in 2019, <coughs> and Photography, Eugenics, uh, Artist Eugenics, Picture and Privilege. Uh, published in 2020. Uh, she's also an editor and contributor of two chapter chapters to the volume Photography and Failure, One Medium's in, uh, Incessant uh, Enlargement and Mishaps, Flops and Disappointments. Uh, and um, she's also the co-editor of the forthcoming volume, These Are Our Stories, Diverse Histories, Narratives and Identities in Photographic Albums. And Chris present uh, the paper, uh, Time Warped, Photography and the Annihilation of Temporality and Space. Thank you. And I wanted to thank Olga and Friedrich and, and uh, also Maria for your patience and your patience with our technology. Uh, we really appreciate all of your help. And I also wanted to thank you all for coming this morning. And for, for many of you, I know it's getting quite late or it is the middle of the night. So thank you for, for being here. I appreciate it. In The Painter of Modern Life, an essay which has shaped our definition of modernity, Charles Baudelaire wrote, and I quote, 
The aim for the artist is to extract from fashion the poetry that resides in its historical envelope, to distill the eternal from the transitory. By modernity, I mean the transitory, the fleeting, the contingent, the half of art whose other half is eternal and immutable." End quote. Ironically, although Baudelaire was not an advocate of the medium of photography as anything but an aid to art making and to science, improvements in the sensitivity of photochemistry and lenses, faster shutter speeds, and more made achievable the image of instantaneous time within a few years of the medium's invention. As a result, capturing spatial relationships in a fraction of a moment, which Baudelaire defined as synonymous with an expression of modernity, quickly became a normative expectation of photography. But is instantaneous, instantaneous photography such a straightforward manner of conceiving a relationship of photography's relationship to time? And today I'm going to take a closer look at exemplary images by two pioneers of instantaneous photography, Edward Morbridge and Harold Edgerton, to explore those questions. And I'll test the parameters of the medium's representation of instantaneous time and suggest that there is something modern about it. Many art historical narratives emphasize photography's positivist technological determinist mission in the 19th century as a quest to exceed its own limitations by decreasing shutter speeds, exposure times, and making better lenses. The motion studies of Moybridge and Edgerton typically are cited as groundbreaking examples of the medium's mastery of the challenge of capturing the temporal instance, instant rather. In the late 1870s, California Governor Leland Stanford founder and director of Central Pacific Railroad, an institution that took pride in its reputation for annihilating time and space by transporting passengers over land with unprecedented velocity, hired Moybridge to employ photography to determine whether all four feet of a horse are off the ground at any point during mid gallop. After examination and experimentation with different camera systems, Moybridge made a series of photographs at the one mile track at Stanford's Palo Alto stock farm on June 19th, 1878. The horse in motion, Sally Gardner, owned by Leland Stanford in, sil in silhouette against a white braided background, marked by consecutively numbered segments of uniform size as she ran at a speed of about 40 miles per hour past Moybridge's battery of 12 cameras equipped with stereoscopic lenses as she tripped the threads to release their shutters. As the title implies, the series of images represents durations of elapsed time expressed in 12 separate images of stilled instantaneous time, each representing an infinitesimal duration of about one one thousandth of a second. The title implies that the series represents a narrative story of a run. Moybridge's images are read, as most literary works are in the English language, in linear sequence from top to bottom, left to right. Gaps of about a half second in duration lie between each of Moybridge's images and imply unseen lapses of time within which the horse's body moved to the position that we see in the next frame. Time's passage thus is implied by changes in the spatial location and coordinates of Sally's body over time. Thus, temporal lapse of time, temporal lapses of time provide temporal spaces in which the viewer fills in with their own narratives, as in we can assume what happened between the frames, given the interpretive framework of the title, The Horse in Motion, Sally Gardner, running at a 140 gate at the Palo Alto track. The gaps of time between the exposures function as they do in Daguerre's Boulevard de Temple by implying of time unseen whose consequences we see. In Moibridge's Horse in Motion, time is represented as the agent of dynamic motion and change. The series of photographs begins with Sally in full gallop. It therefore implies the existence of a temporal continuum of action that happened before the, mo the moments that we see captured in these photographs. However, Sally's run ends amazingly briefly in the final image and uh, you see a detail of the last two frames above. 
In the 12th photograph, numbers on the grid defy the sequential numbering order, and the estimated half second interval between the other images is broken. Even if the grid's numerical count repeated between the last two photographs, the writer would have undergone a sudden change of speed from an average speed of covering one quadrant per second to a slowdown speed of covering at least five quadrants per second. In other words, Sally Gardner, if these images were correct, would have had to accelerate to five times her speed to about 200 miles an hour between the last two frames. This is implausible for two reasons. First, horses can only run between 45 to 50 miles per hour. And secondly, it would have been impossible for Sally to come to an abrupt and complete stop after accelerating to five times her speed. The final images break the temporal cadence of a half second of elapsed time between each one one thousandth of a second exposure and abruptly, abruptly fracture the linear progression of time that viewers expect for the images. It is likely that Moybridge added images to his series from other sequences of photographs and to assume that he decided that he wanted to add an image that represented the completion of the act of running. Moybridge's decision to insert the concluding image of Sally at rest closes the series as a finished duration, as a becoming that finally became and it provides a temporal completion of the physical act of the run. In The Horse in Motion, Moybridge provides both the ing and the thing, the action and its materialized conclusion. Moybridge here gives the series temporal closure. However, what about the beginning of the run, which takes place off camera in unrepresented moments? Why not illustrate its start as well as its finish? Moybridge instead gives the viewer a temporal continuum already in progress, in which the viewer's experience is only partial. This is not entirely foreign to us. Our individual awarenesses of time, after all, do not include our personal starting event, which is our birth, but instead our memories and personal histories begin between ages three and five. Time supersedes and surpasses us, and we necessarily experience only a portion of time seemingly endless continuum, but in the macro sense, as Baudelaire implies, expressions of the experience of modernity are synonymous with arrested dynamism with glimpses of only a part and partial dynamic fragment of a temporal continuum that is in the throes of change. And indeed, in the two frames of Moybridge's Force in Motion series, yes, uh, as you can see, there are multiple points in a horse's run in which the feet are off the ground, which provided proof that Stanford wanted to affirm unsupported carriage of the horse. Morbidge's photographs immediately were published in magazines and newspapers worldwide. An article written by the editor of Horse Racing Magazine called Moybridge's photographs as unerring, while also pointing out, and I quote, it's difficult on the verge of impossibility to explain why what we see with our eyes on the race course differs so much from what we see on the plate of the photographer, end quote. As Philip Proger explained, during Moybridge's time, the word instantaneous was, and I quote, shorthand for authenticity, trustworthiness, and was a synonym for from life, from nature, and naturalism, end quote. However, Thierry de Duve argues that Moybridge's instantaneous photographs represent a paradox in photography's representation of time, the medium's contradictory ability to represent with great fidelity a series of instantaneous time movements, while not representing movement. He argues, and I quote, either the photograph registers a singular event or it makes the event from itself in the image. The problem with the first alternative is that reality is not made out of singular events. It is made out of continuous happenings of events, end quote. By placing his photographs in a series, Moybridge implies the linear progression by breaking the continuity of time into some of its constituent parts and some reassembled. Viewers temporally reconstruct Moybridge's bits of time from the past in the present time and create a linear narrative time for the photographs, illustrating Jonathan Crary's suggestion that temporarily is subjectively embodied in the viewer and is constructed. Dr. Harold Edgerton and his stroboscopic photographs raise additional grounds for interrogating the temporal dimensions and scientific value of scientific or instantaneous photographs. To make photographs such as Death of Light Bulb from 1936, Edgerton placed an object in total darkness. 
His stroboscopic device was triggered when a microphone registered sound, in this case, the discharge of a bullet, and an electric current prompted the firing of a flash. Edgerton's device emitted a burst of light lasting one microsecond or one millionth of a second, which provided sufficient light exposure for the photographic plate. Edgerton developed this stroboscopic technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1931. Edgerton's stroboscopic work affirmed, affirmed a lesson that William Henry Fox Talbot learned in his original Leiden jar experiments, that the speed of photography no longer be dictated by the speed of shutters, but by the much more rapid action of light. Edgerton argued that his images presented facts about infinitesimal moments previously inaccessible to the human eye, because the human eye to brain relay response is far too slow to allow us to isolate two separate images that reach the eye within less than an estimated one-tenth of a second of each other. Thus, a succession of images with a speed greater than one one-tenth of a second appears as an uninterrupted sequence. This phenomenon called persistence of vision makes it possible for us to view cinematic works, animations, and raster scan computer monitors with continuity. In images such as Death of a Light Bulb, Edgerton gives physical form to the spatial relationships of objects with an in an impossibly infinitesimal instant of time. The true value of these images cannot be verified by the human eye. Stroboscopic photographs such as death of a light bulb require faith in the neutrality of the stroboscope in the camera and in the truth value of photography as a whole. This trust is predicated on a perception that the photographic medium would provide an absolute visual record of spatial relations between objects in time. If abstraction occurred, as it did, for instance, in Moybridge's photographs, which revealed, of course, horses running out of sequence. It was accommodated because the fraction of time in instantaneous time images differed from what was perceptible or confirmable by the human eye. Andre Bazan has argued that photography is an objective form of representation because it uses a neutral mechanical camera obscure device to record light reflected from objects. Bazan further argued that but a photograph embalms time, rescuing it from its proper corruption, end quote. The corruption, of course, to which Bezine refers is time steadily flowing, never ending stream. For instance, in the case of death of a light bulb, we see four photographs taken with a stroboscope, calibrated for one ninth of a second. When read in sequential order from top to bottom, the four photographs represent a bullet's passage through a light bulb broken into apparently equal intervals of time's passage. In the first frame, the bullet approaches the light bulb from the left at more than two times the speed of sound. The bulb is untouched. The bullet is sublimely stilled in mid-flight. The images depict not what we see, but what we know. Bullets move through space at great speed, even if we can only see the start and end and the result of what happened with our unaided eyes. The photograph has an estranged perception to perceived reality and therefore is an abstraction to us. But because Death of a Light Bulb was produced by an MIT professor who preferred to himself as an engineer, the images were regarded as therefore more scientific than most. Produced by a machine that removed the potential of human error from the process, Edgerton's photograph as a series was seen as truthful to the appearance of the bullet frozen in mid-flight. Death of a light bulb gives form and visual definition to a slice of time that we cannot, that we otherwise cannot access. Redefining previous conceptualizations of the momentary. Marta Braun has written about Edgerton's stroboscopic photographs and their ability to create perceptions of temporal reality. And I quote, the photographs reconfirm our belief in the camera's power to picture reality as something we can see. They persuade us once more to accept the belief that the ultimate arbiter of reality is finally what can be pictured by a camera, end quote. And the title of this photographic series, The Death of a Light Bulb, not only personifies the object, it gives it a temporal life cycle comparable to our own. Time in the first frame of the series is an anticipatory future sense, a uh, future tense rather, as viewers know that one millionth of a second later, the inanimate but personified light bulb will die as the bullet approaches it and in fact makes contact. 
Time's passage is expressed by the bullet's movement through space. As the bullet enters the light bulb in the second image, the glass cracks precede the bullet, moving even faster than the projectile itself, lending the image a sense of past tense. The bullet lags in speed behind the cracking glass. And presentness, the bullet just entered the light bulb and future anticipatory sense as viewers in a Roland Barthes sense, await the full collapse and death of the light bulb. In Edgerton's third image, no bullet appears at all. The projectile is contained within the light bulb and viewers anticipate its continued future travel through the other side and the completion of the light bulb's destruction and death. The other side of the light bulb has begun to crack even before the bullet penetrates it as a result of the 15,000 feet per second compression wave of force that precedes the bullet. The path of the bullet is marked by the powder of crushed glass, which trails its passage and implies the past tense event of penetrating the bulb. And in the final image, the bullet has finished its travel through the light bulb, leaving the bulb's surface cracked and fully marred. And the bullet's path is filled with the residue of glass dust. This image implies past tense, marked by the physical proof of the bullet's travel through the light bulb, present tense, the bulb has not yet collapsed, and anticipatory future sense, the light bulb is going to crumble. The, the series ends at this point, leaving no further future possibilities unspecified. I, for one, wonder, after looking at these images for a while, where'd the bullet go? What does his wall look like? What did the light bulb's collapse look like? Unlike Moybridge's horse in motion, Edgerton leaves this photographic series unclosed and unresolved. As such, a lingering uncertain future tense lies beyond the frames of these images. However, a closer examination of the position of the light bulb's cracks, which are in different locations in images two, three, and four, divulge a secret. Edgerton's photographs were not made in consecutive microseconds or even with an even interval between images. Death of the light bulb is comprised of four images of four different light bulbs as they're penetrated by four different bullets. Edgerton was not the first to do this. I remind you that Moybridge's horse in motion involved a non-sequential visual narrative and an estimated 80% of Moybridge's prior motion studies for the University of Pennsylvania, including this one, were edited and recomposed in a, as a series in the same fashion. This is an example from his animal lo locomotion series. In, in which there was splicing and dicing. Edgerton's four chosen photographs reveal microseconds of a non-consecutive, non-linear, creatively refashioned time to make a new narrative of the death of a light bulb, or rather four different light bulbs. The individual photographs may be unverifiably regarded as truthful to a microsecond long appearance of spatial relationships of the light bulb and bullet in the context of four separate light bulbs deaths. But the series is not truthful to the appearance of a singular bullet's passage and killing of a single light bulb. Edgerton's alteration of the series also implies failings in the design of the stroboscope. Film cannot be advanced in less than a microsecond. So no more than one exposure can occur with each, each light bulb shooting event. But the scientific validity of Edgerton's image, which circulated within the scientific community and also found their way into general readership magazines, such as National Geographic and Life, is called into question. Edgerton's image, though, illustrates a characteristic of the photographic medium that's also noted by Charles Sanders Peirce, that a photograph's relationship to the truth can be and often is conditional. A photograph can be truthful to one kind of knowledge, the physical appearances of a light bulb as a bullet passes through them, but not to another, the appearance of one light bulb in successive microseconds as it's punctured by a bullet. So what do we make of these complex differing expressions of instantaneous time, which do provide us images of spatial relationships in the fraction of a moment, but which also reveal reordered non-sequential temporal conundrums. Even instantaneous time in photography is anything but straightforward or factual or true to the logic of the temporal fragment. Jonathan Prairie grants importance to the role of the viewer in interpreting and determining reality. 
which Crary argues is shaped by an inanimate embodied human subjectivity that is unique to the age of modernity. I might remind you all that photography is a, a true, an agent of and product of modernity itself. Although Baudelaire suggested that an image capturing a fleeting moment of time encapsulates a decisively modern fragmented experience of temporality, Crary complicates this view by arguing that a viewer's subjective changeable temporal processing of such images might be the essence of modernity. He suggests that a modern time is redefined as an embodied individualized temporality. But I also would add that modernity is a phenomenon not synonymous with modernism, although many modern artists deal with it as a subject. It's an age of simultaneous competing, compressed and increasingly subjective times and spaces, an age in which time standardization has conflicted with its biological, personalized and embodied experience. The invention of photography, perhaps not entirely without coincidence, emerged as Newtonian postulates of concrete, steady, temporal, and spatial coordinates were dissolved by new theories of quantum mechanics of many figures, including Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen. The unfixing of the matrices of the known world likewise relegated time and space and matter to provisional status. Theories of temporal subjectivity by Henri Bergson and Martin Heidegger and many others work to encourage this view of a relative world with no absolutes, operating without fixed forms of reference where objects are dependent upon observing subjects to give them interpretive form and meaning. Instantaneous photographies, expressions of temporality are many complex and layered and time in a photograph, therefore, is not embalmed, as Bazin has suggested, but is sculptural, multiplicitous, dynamic, and enlivened. Moreover, photography, therefore, becomes a unique medium for expressing the sensation of living with time's unfixity and its relentless passage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so we have a uh, few minutes for the questions. We decided just to do it to shift the schedule. So we have, uh, have time for brief questions and answers. Uh, does anybody want to ask? Well, I might be uh, asked some short question. Uh, well, if I uh, if I got uh, all, all your ideas right, uh, uh, I don't know. But maybe uh, did you consider the um, somehow the non uh, instantiable uh, images, long, long staged uh, images, or the images with long exposure? Uh, so how they could be um, considered in this? Uh, from this point of view, so uh, because when you show these images with the uh, light, uh, I I thought that it could be comparable of the the early uh, image uh, photographs with the long exposure and this stroboscopic. So how they could be, I don't know. The, yeah, to... um, absolutely. I um when I this this came out of my doctoral dissertation, which became the the time warped book uh, that actually dealt with each chapter had a different kind of uh, photographic relationship to time. Um, I, I dealt with extended sp exposures, a panorama image in which there is a moving camera and a durational exposure. But I also looked at uh, Daguerre's Boulevard de Tocqueville, uh, which is actually on my wall of my office, about eight feet wide as I'm locating things in it. Uh, mm -hmm. So a little nerding going on there. Uh, a little something that I know only probably this crowd could appreciate as to my husband be as excited about as I am. Um, but yeah, so I look at ex everything from extended exposure to also something called strip photography, often used at racetracks, in which the film is moving on the reels of a camera at the estimated speed of the running objects, horses, dogs, cars. And, at, and there is a, an aperture, the opening of the camera is only a small slit. So, so I, I looked at like device altered photographs in which the recording field and the camera is, is quite different from an extended exposure. It's kind of in the land between 
of photography and cinema. As the film moves, it captures only moving objects as they move through the field. And those are full of really fantastic distortions and they're a little mind blowing. I, I wanna see if I, if I, uh, I think the first page of my presentation I've, I've hijacked and screen shared. Um, oh no, sorry, I don't have, I did. I um, decided to take those out of, <laughs> of the talk, sorry. But um, you have missing legs, you have bendy, bendy oars used by rowers. Um, they're, they're full of distortions as objects were moving back and forth into and out of that strip of exposure. So there, anyway, um, I, as you could tell, I could nerd out about this for quite a while, but um, yes, they're absolutely, oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Brian, I appreciate it. But um, so the streaks, that is the dirt and non-moving objects don't appear at all. And, and in fact, in the dark room, and this is an analog image, a, the line is added, the finish line is actually added. And nothing, I, I, when I started researching these images, I wanted to find out if you could, if there were, I mean, because they're full of visual distortions. If you look at the length of the horse's legs, you can see that horse number 12 has some, something wrong with its back right leg. And some of the legs appear to be shorter or longer. Uh, some of them even appear what they call a rubbery leg, where they look like they're, they're kind of, but those legs are moving in and out of the recording field, which again, uh, I believe the sensitivity of these is several thousandth of a second. Uh, but nothing can appear on camera until it actually physically is in front of the aperture. So I wanted to find that these were problematic in a court of law, but they are a kind of image that is wildly untruthful to the appearance of the horses, but truthful to the appearance of who got there first, which is what matters. And I would say the only thing that matters to horse racing, uh, particularly if you're betting on those horses. Um, so yes, I, I looked at several different kinds of, and thank you very much, Brian, for for DJing some images in there for me. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, uh, is it see, we, we, do, do we have the question from Brian as well, Brian? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Brian, but you have to unmute yourself. No, Sorry. it's unmuted. Ah. Yes, it's, it's audible now. Uh, hello? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, right. No, I, I, I have a, a strip photo at the end of my lecture uh, yes. made by A.L. Weitzman uh, when he was my student at the AA. Um, and it, uh, he, he put the strip camera on a wheelbarrow and moved the camera itself with the extraordinary effect that we, you'll see when I show you my lecture that everybody was moving in the same direction uh, across London Bridge. In other words, what it was recording was not images in space, but images in time. And of course, everybody goes forward in time in the same direction towards death. This is the uh, import of Mark Cousins' brilliant uh, commentary on that project that was published by the AA. I'll show you that at the end of my lecture. So that's a great image. Um, Andrew David Hazy at the Rochester Institute of Technology is also experimenting a lot with people running in different directions and photographing them as they're all running in the same direction. It's mind blowing, uh, but kind of incredible to see. I'm glad that you're showing those. I appreciate that. And also I wanted to note that uh, the Flusser discussion earlier by Nancy uh, ties in so much of my paper in, I think, some wonderful ways. I'm looking forward to the general discussion at the end. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you so much for your talk and uh, yeah, for the discussion. Where hopefully we will have um, the time later. And now it is time to uh, hand it over to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Brian Hatton, um, 
and I uh, well, give some information about biography. Uh, well, Brian uh, graduated in art history at the University of East Anglia and then did postgrad graduated uh, in architectural theory in Essex University. Um, uh, Brian Hayden has written as a critique on art and architecture for many journals, including Project uh, Valche in St. Petersburg. He started writing about Dan Graham in 1991 and in 1999 contributed to a monograph on John Hiller. Uh, he has taught, has taught uh, at the Architectural Association London since 1990. 83 and at Liverpool John Moses University since 1990. And uh, uh, in 19, uh, 2009, he was Senior Mellon Fellow at the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. Um, so, and uh, he presented the paper John Hillard and John Graham Passing Time. My topic is how aspects of time have entered works by Dan Graham born in 1942, and John Hilliard, who was born in 1945. Graham is now known for his pavilions of two-way mirror glass, which you can see here, one uh, in, uh, uh, I think, uh, South America, um, um, which I think is, in a way, the best translation of the word camera as a room, as well as a camera, as it were. Um, um, so Graham start, uh, is known for these pavilions now, but he started in the milieu of minimalism with photo documentations, which I'll show you in a moment, before going on to make films, performances and video works. He also writes on architecture, media and photography. His first essay was called Mybridge Moments, uh, also known as Photographs of Motion, on Mybridge. Um, Hilliard began by making and illuminating coloured illustrations, uh, coloured uh, installations and then photographing them. But his way of documenting them led him into a lifelong exploration of the means and conditions of photography. Graham and Hilliard are friends, they share interests, and Hilliard set his photo scene um, uh, safe for Dan Graham, which um, you can uh, see now here in a moment. I'll come back to this picture in uh, later. Um, and he said he, he took this photograph viewing through um, the glass of one of Graham's mirror glass pavilions at London's Serpentine Gallery. Um, but before the, the uh, examining their work, I want to make some general remarks on photographs, films and time. Uh, like a drawing, a print or a painting, a photograph is an effectively two-dimensional image, a finite and static object in space. It is isomorphically apt for representing other objects' spatial properties, such as shape, colour and relation to objects. But its finite and static condition is not isomorphically apt for rendering changes in objects' properties and relations. So here I'm showing you a painting by John Souch, a painter in the north of England, this painting is Man in Manchester, um, which is a very remarkable picture um, of Sir John Astin, Astin, sorry, and his wife, dead and alive. She died in childbirth, there's the cradle covered in black velvet. And uh, he uh, is stood next to her uh, with, um, um, instruments of measurement, but of course it's also a cross. And now the point here is that the dead lady was painted from life, as it were, as a corpse. The version of her alive uh, sat at the foot of the bed was done, as it were, from memory or from, from record. Um, you couldn't do that with a, a, a camera. Unless, of course, you could photograph a ghost. Maybe the ghost of the lady is sat at the bottom of, of the bed. If ghosts could really be seen, then you could uh, do that. Otherwise, you would have to do some kind of double exposure or montage. Um, changes uh, are not apt for still photographs. That's a, a, a theme I want to uh, explore here. 
Um, now it's true um, in, in, in which in witness it is in witnessing such changes that we as conscious subjects experience the phenomenon we name as time. It's true that time awareness also needs other subjective faculties such as memory. But if nothing objectively changed, it seems unlikely that we could experience or even conceive of time. For this reason, a finite still image, apt essentially to represent static objects, would seem initially ill-suited to represent time, even in an objective re register of chronometry, let alone a subjective register of memory, intimation, anticipation, loss, or hope, and so forth. And yet, paradoxically, as innumerable witnesses and histories of art have shown, our contemplation of still images uh, has inspired intimations of and reflections upon time. Here are two paintings by Zerberan, Spanish painter of 17th century, uh, both still life. Um, and um, I think that this ability of a still image to intimate uh, some notion of time, um, maybe because a still image works like a mirror in which we sense the present moment of our beholding reflected back to us as an image of or from eternity. It seems a cusp between a transient now and a transcendent infinity. That may seem mysterious, but I think that stillness is a mystery one that remains notably unexplored in phenomenology. More needs to be said about stillness. A still image uh, like that in uh, John Keats's poem, The Ode on the Grecian Urn, is a balm against entropy and fatality. Around the urn, Keats describes ancient figures. They turn yet never move. The movements, the moments are drawn out beyond time. And he writes, bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. But few images offer such pure portals. Um, most especially photographs, are compounds of profane interest and, co and practical contingency. But so too, as measured by knives, forks, utens, uh, spoons and clocks, is most of our time itself. Ubiquitous now among those economic utensils is the camera, which is itself a kind of clock, because A, its exposures entail timings, just as exact as apertures, as its apertures, and B, photographs are indices of the occasions and conditions of their production. But both clock and camera register time only by visual analogues, altered states of position, form and quality. Sand in an hourglass, a clock face arm, are special indicators of temporal passage. A qualitative index is that of light on silver salt. Movies would be better named changes and kinematography maybe should call, be called metagraphy because what film essentially records are changes over time over, of which movements are but one kind. No movements appear in Andy Warhol's Empire State. Uh, there's some uh, uh, frames from that uh, immensely long uh, and uh, un unmoving movie. Um, but the skylights and the window lights change and so passing time is represented. In practice though, spatial alterations have proven the commonest index whereby to represent time. And so we got the movies. But of course movies were composed by a succession of still photographs of the kind that Mybridge uh, had deployed and which, as Dan Graham observed in his Mybridge essay, 
appear like the illustrations of Zeno's paradox. He wrote, um, if at each instant the flying arrow is at rest, when does it move? That was Zeno's uh, conjecture. And Dan Graham added, Zeno's object was to prove that continuous motion in time did not logically exist. But as Zeno's claims for any kind of change, uh, hold, they hold, uh, Zeno's claim holds for any kind of change, then his paradox, if sustained, might be extended to refute the existence not only of motion and change, but of time itself. If 19th century attempts to capture motion in still images resulted simply in sequences of what we might call Zeno moments, then they found two ways of formulating them. Mybridge set each series of discrete shots in grid arrays. His method was apt for showing anatomical relations as they changed through muscular efforts. But as a representation of time, they had three failings. First, his staging of models against the standard metric back wall isolated them into placeless specimens. Second, the grid format abstracted them from temporal sequence into a synchronic array, rather like the biological and crystallographical typologies uh, of 18th century science. Third, such abstraction tended to remove from them any indication of entropy, the great 19th century discovery in the second law of thermodynamics, the arrow of time, the phenomenon that sets and makes experience uh, experienceable the direction of time's arrow from past into future. For instance, smoke does not converge um, into flues, stains don't contract to a spill, and as the young uh, genius, the 14-year-old heroine of Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia remarks, we can stir things together and yet we can't stir them apart. You carry on stirring, things just get more and more mixed up. That's entropy for you. You can't just kind of reverse the process. But a Mybridge grid gives no indication as to whether it runs from A to Z or from Z to A. Only familiarity tells us that generally horses don't run and jump backwards. More suggestive, I think, of time's arrow was Jules Marais' uh, uh, way of multi-exposing one plate so as to capture each Zeno moment in a single image. Its resemblance to paintings by Duchamp, Boccioni and Bregaglia's futurist photodynamics has often been noticed. But here I would stress simply the two methods of photographic representation. One, a sequence of images, uh, a spatial array, um, and the other simple, simultaneously set in a single multi-exposed image. Sequential series best convey temporal order, not in a grid, but in a, a, a line of prints or a sequence of slide projections. Multiple exposures, whereas, spur us to imagine places passed through over time by not just traces, ghosts, and memories, but conjectures, dreams, and wishes. In so doing, the simultaneous montage becomes a medium for both indicative and subjunctive time, that is, both of is and was, uh, but also of might have been, uh, might be, could be, may be, will. Those are the, con those are the subjunctive surmises. The indicative is the simple is or will be or was. Both sequential and simultaneous modes were used by Graham and Hilliard. But I'll begin with a work where a grid implied no temporal sequence. Um, let me just show you the next. Um, here is a, a, a Mare uh, array of photo, photograph, a choice of them. Um, including this one, I believe he took of, of smoke uh, being driven in streams, which 
is to some extent capturing the entropic phenomena that I've just been describing. And next to it, I placed some photographs of Loy Fuller's amazing dances, which I, I think um, uh, are very much of that moment. Now let's go forward to uh, Dan Graham. Um, it was the first of his many hybrid uh, uh, projects. Dan Graham's Homes for America, 1966, was part typology, part social report on new suburban houses. But he presented the permutations in a flat account, rather like those of minimalist works by uh, Solowit, Don Judd, uh, Robert Smutson and others, who drained content from works so as to focus on their structure by using grids and serial formats. So in, the, in this uh, per that you can see now, he's photographed these new houses, um, but also noted uh, that you could get combinations of their typologies, uh, which he then um, uh, sort of spread out in, in a exhaustive permutations uh, from A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, uh, to D, C, B, D, and so on. Uh, and he, he goes into some great length about this. He does it with the colours and the shapes and, and so on. And um, you think it's, it's just a, an architectural description, but then it begins to seem like the a description by, let's say, Don Judd or, or, or Solowit, on which are really instructions on how to set up an array of uh, serial objects in a minimalist installation. Um, but then a third thing happens. So let's just have, there's Don Judd um, with, uh, on the left and, and the two rows on the top, and there's a Solowit array uh, on the bottom. Um, and the, on the right, uh, in perspective, you can see the somewhat different kind of approach to serial work by Robert Smithson. Um, Don, uh, Dan Graham was running a, a gallery at that time in which he exhibited these artists, uh, along with um, Dan, Dan Flavin, uh, who was doing optical uh, luminous installation. So this was very much the format of, of minimalist works that were being uh, uh, explored at that time. And I think that basically uh, what, what Dan Graham did in Homes for America was to um, adopt this concept of the notion of a schema or a format. Um, rather, rather, you know, Erwin Panofsky talks about Panofsky, uh, talks about per perspective as if it were itself um, a symbolic form. And you could say that the serial array is also a symbolic form in Panofsky's terms. But he does something else as well, because he also makes a social report of people beginning to move into these uh, estates and beginning to inhabit them uh, and live their life forward, as it were, uh, in an exploratory way. Uh, which exceeds the, the simple minimalist framework and serial framework of their mass production. Um, and um, you might say that in the suburbs, uh, Graham found a minimalist world in real time where subjects could not be excluded from objects. Um, the next work. In 1969, a couple of years later, far away from the suburbs, when he was working in Nova Scotia, he found in a Nova Scotia uh, sky, he found a place where space could, could not be perceived without time. So first of all, he finds a place that cannot be perceived without uh, a, 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 um, time in the suburb, and now he finds it in nature. This work called Sunset to Sunrise was two series of 80 photographs each at taken at six second intervals and 18 degree shifts in orientation relative to the sun's position. He took the first 80, uh, uh, they took the initial orientation at sunset looking west and the second 80 were taken um, from sunrise uh, uh, looking east. And uh, he said they composed, and here's a quote, a complete map of the sky 
its point of inception being the sun setting on the horizon, beginning with this point as nearest and most measurable distance in space, the photos extend in a spiral so that in 80 shots, the top of the sky, the furthest extension of immeasurable space is reached. Beginning at sunrise the next day, at the same place and point at the top of the sky, the process is reversed downward in the spiral to meet the sun as it rises above the horizon. So um, this work, uh, uh, it, it exhibited a line of 160 photographs and presented a palindrome in space, but oriented in its temporal order by the ultimate regularity of the sun's fall and rise. Now I've suggested um, above that time is noticeable only by changes in space. Um, but here, Graham observes the opposite, um, or, or its complement, let's say, that in fact we can notice uh, space only through, no, through changes in time. He wrote, we would not notice the space of the sky if it were never disturbed by clouds and night. Space reads as a time shift, diurnal shift to darkness relative to the sun as light source and the relative shift of clouds relative to each other and to the framing edge, ending the view of one particular moment. And what's in the air at a particular time relative to our view. The eight minutes duration uh, it takes to realize the a priori schema of relative distance. Um, now, after that, um, Graham went on to a very extensive career, which you can all follow, um, using video performance um, and uh, then his pavilions. Um, he was always involved in trying to bring subjects in relation to each other within an objective situation. Um, one of his most famous works uh, using video was this one, which is in Paris, uh, present continuous past, where you stand in a room where you see yourself simultaneously in a mirror, but the camera, uh, video camera, relays you back at an eight second delay, which is very weird because uh, it disorients your, your notion of the present. It disorients your notion of who you are uh, and what you were doing eight seconds ago, which nobody can ever remember what you were doing eight seconds ago. Um, and uh, it invariably produces gales of laughter and, and uh, kind of giddy behavior. So here's Dan bouncing up and down and seeing himself bounce up and down at a delayed time. And he did about 14 or 15 of, of uh, progressively more complex uh, versions of this. So let's go on to Hilliard now. Um, yeah, Brian, I'm yeah. sorry to say it, but uh, uh, you've already talked 20 minutes and we have maximum five minutes if, if you uh, can. Okay, it. well, I'll try to... Sorry, sorry. I, to interrupt, but... Yeah. I read this out and timed it at 25 minutes, but um, anyway, right, okay. Um, right. With Hilliard, we move again from a synchronic grid format to works that involve temporal readings. His 1970 work, 36 views of Jack Chesworth's head, turned Ch Chesworth 10 degrees between each shot. As still as an object, he remains as unchanging as the light and so the views give no intimation of passing time. Indeed, they could not have been shot, they could have been shot simultaneously by a ring of 36 cameras, although the presentation in, in the final work squares the circle into a timeless grid. Also uh, a grid, um, but not changeless, was his 1971 63 ways of looking at genie. Here, Genie slightly alters pose in each shot, but the real subject is shown in the grid as the, uh, 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 as the range across aperture from F2 to F16 and exposure time from one second to 250th. A third 1971 grid makes this explicit. It's as self-referentially autonomous as any minimalist or conceptual work. A camera recording its own condition, seven apertures, 10 speeds, two mirrors, excluded narrative time, but included the timing of its 
making, both by the light dark range of exposures and by showing in a, a, a reverse mirror, you see the detail, um, the, uh, uh, the altering aperture and exposure numbers. Um, three of the works displayed their timing structure more directly, replacing grid format by strip series. 60 seconds of light with two shots of uh, an exposure timer in a row between correct and bleached images. And, uh, sorry, that's that one. Uh, 10 runs past the fixed point was a double row shot by two photographers of each other, one from a static camera, the other while running by. As the exposures lengthened through the series, the images got lighter but blurred. Or was it the other way around? Were the exposures uh, uh, shortened rather than lengthened? The shots were evidently made at different moments in time, but as the role could be shown either way, we can't see which really came first, or indeed which in which order the, uh, the sequence was shot. The left-right sequence uh, as displayed is thus not a reliable indication of time's arrow. More reliable seeming, but again not certain, was the sequence in another work, Fall, here the exposures in both rows stayed the same and only those shot by the moving camera become blurred. So one guy falls over holding his camera and of course uh, shakes the camera. The other guy watching him uh, remains still but sees the... So one is a subjective record and the other is a, an objective record, you might say. Um, so, for, I mean, Fall seems a more reliable guide um, to time because the moving photographer here was not running but falling, and falling is impossible to do reverse. And so, falling leaves are uh, entropic signs of time's direction. Yet, there is in fact nothing reliable about this work's apparent sequence. The last shot may have been staged before the first, or perhaps on another occasion altogether. Staged is an appropriate word to consider here. Um, as demonstrated in the fantastic and humorous uh, sequence staged by the artist Keith Arnott of his own sinking or emergence from or into, into or from the earth. Much of Hilliard's uh, work has turned on ways that ph photographs are unreliable. These is examined in ambiguous images made by manipulating photography's conditions, parameters and formats. Not least among those uncertain axes is that of time. For time or timing in a photograph can never be more than conjecture. In two series of works, one dealing with cropping and framing and the other with focus and field depth, conjecture became, became both thematic and a modus operandi. Cause of death, question, showed four differently cropped and captioned versions of the same photo of a person lying apparently dead on the ground, titled Crushed, Burned, Drowned, Fell. Each was cropped in a way that revealed different adjacent uh, evidence that could, could support the conjecture in each case. Uh, so the drowned photo revealed that the body was on the shore, the burn was, ne uh, she was ne lying next to a fire. Evidence is what is evident, but what is evident in a photo is never proof of what happened, but only of what might have happened, what may be happening, or may be about to happen. happen. In other words, it's subjunctive, not indicative. An image is temporal modality, uh, it, it's, sub, it, it's sub, sub, subjunctive quality, um, um, is, 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 is no exception. It never represents an is or a was, but always a might be or a maybe. In German, uh, we could think of the word Möglichkeit, which could be translated in English as mightlyhood uh, or maylyhood, what may happen, what might happen. Um, another study in cropping, Jacqueline began, uh, was titled, was among the first in his fascination with fictive and speculative implications. We see three different croppings of the same photo of a sleep, sleeping woman. One focuses on her head with a caption that describes her awakening. The next shows her full length with a man's hands caressing her thigh and a caption describing how this caused her to awaken. The third again frames her head 
but widens to reveal hands moving towards her with a syringe. This time the caption says that she'll walk in pain, prompting a nurse to bring her an injection of morphine. Three simple lateral alterations illustrate different stories that might be told from the same photograph. Changes induce ideas of time, but no still image alone can indicate a sequence of cause and effect without a supplementary explanation. When our eyes encounter a complex scene without guidance, we seek uh, that information by scanning, not only across our field of vision, but also by directing our attention to particular points at, at various distances. Cameras can't do that, but what they can do is focus on planes at various depths, foreground, midground, and background. Hilliard used this scope for different focal planes um, to generate further works that explored ambiguities and aporias in photographic images, starting with serial arrays and then moving to multiple exposures. Interpretation may have a procedural or even a forensic aspect, as evidence in several triptychs where Hilliard focused on a foreground in one, a midground in the next, and deep ground in the third. As in the cropped works, captions offered explanations that didn't actually resolve the story or logic of what the photographs seemed to show. In his work, He Sat Gazing at the Mirror, a suicide is implied but open to doubt. And in the uh, first uh, photo of the most, most plausible theory, we see twigs floating on the surface of a pool. Deeper focused, the second reveals a watch beneath the surface. The third, now in a distant focus, shows a reflection of the sky and a man hanging in the tree. The caption proposes that, uh, you know, it gives a kind of uh, police report of uh, how they think he, 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 threw, he fell, uh, threw himself out of a plane. The most plausible theory is that Mr. Cameron, whose body was found entangled in a tree at the edge of the lake, may have died after jumping without a parachute uh, perhaps believing that the plane was about to crash, but a search by police has failed to find the plane uh, in which the former uh, RAF pilot was last seen. Implied, uh, but un uh, un again uncertain, is a suicide, but in both works, events in time elude us. Later, Hilliard overlaid such events in multiple exposures uh, of increasing complexity. I'm just going to very quickly show these. Um, um, and they often produced effects of, of the multiple exposure uh, comparable to those encountered in Dan Graham's mirror glass pavilions. And this brings us back to uh, this. Um, were at least three planes overlay, that of the glass wall, our images in or seemingly beyond the glass, and those of, act, those of others actually behind the glass. This was the spur to John Hilliard's uh, scene, Safe for Dan Graham. It's also inspired by the famous painting by um, Tintoretto of Susanna and the Bathers. Um, Would you mind coming to... Uh, yeah, I've only got three more slides and, and five more lines. Um, among um, its images of implicitly involved figures, there are doubtless stories in time, but we cannot see that time in its depths. Indeed, not only can we not see temporal depths, as, as Merleau Ponty observed, we cannot even see spatial depths without living in uh, living them. Um, this is a, a work by John Hilliard. Here is a pavilion by uh, Dan Graham and another one by uh, Dan, uh, uh, John Hilliard. Um, they're very systematically done. They're not just arbitrarily. I mean, I'd have to explain them in detail. Um, and so we can even see spatial depths without living them. And that would require more than a photograph. And um, as a, a final point, as a quotation from uh, Merleau Ponty, the phenomenology of perception, by rediscovering the vision of depths, 
that is as a uh, as to say of a depth which is not merely objectified and made up of mutually external points we shall once more outrun the traditional alternatives and elucidate the relation between subject and object perception is initiation into the world um, so um, in the last one you see people constructing uh, an exhibition um, sometimes they're working um, and also they're setting up the uh, reception the refreshments for the opening of the exhibition i did this in a series of symmetrically uh, overlaid uh, photographs pointing each the other way and that's the end of my lecture but i did promise this this is Dale Weitzman's photograph of people on a strip photograph, all crossing uh, London Bridge. They were all going in opposite directions, but in the photograph, all, they all turned into going in the same direction, which I think is the only real uh, record of time uh, or indication of time's arrow that I've shown because they're all moving towards the future, um, i.e. death. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and these were incredibly many images and all of them would have been worth to have been looked at and talked about longer. But uh, I was really impressed. It's, it's a lot, lot of stuff I haven't seen uh, before. So uh, uh, maybe there are some questions. I'm not over, I just switch to gallery view. Okay. Well, the one thing that I'm, that I'm, I, I, start, I started to deviate a little bit the, the very beginning of your lecture actually, because um, if I uh, recall it right, it was that you, uh, what I try to find, what I try to understand is that, that in principle, the, um, uh, how to say, the representation of time also requires the emptying of time from the images in a way, which I found that because uh, it also relates a little bit to, to uh, what Chris had said, that you need to, that if, um, at first there's a, there's a problem to representing time in images at all, just basically, but on the other hand, most photographic images I know, or the how to say the 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 overarching principle of photography seems to be that images should be sharp, defined, that the objects should be, even if they are hanging in the middle of space, they should be uh, they should be defined, they should not be blurry, and all that kind of stuff. All those things that might be read if you are if we know that that might be read as some kind of traces of timeliness are not there. And I, I tried to wrap my head around that, that on the one hand, you have this kind of timeliness, and on the other hand, you have that time, that kind of, um, how to say, evacuation of, out of, of time out of the images, which I find uh, just, um, yeah, just weird. And I found it interesting to see that in the images you showed uh, as well, where it sometimes, uh, for instance, in the case of the of the uh, of the falling camera, it is being being brought into play. But usually, all those images are sharp, defined, unblurry, uh, all this kind of stuff. Maybe the yeah, maybe it's a question already to the two of you. But maybe Brian, you can answer first. Um, <clears throat> well, I. Um... I'm completely with you on this uh, you know, sense of not being ever able quite to uh, say what this phenomenon really amounts to. But I, I don't think we're newcomers here. I think this problem started with St. Augustine, I think. He was the first person to talk about subjective time. Um, maybe one place to begin would be my attempt to distinguish time from timing. Um, the English architect Cedric Price often used to say that when you design uh, designing buildings, it's not just a matter of space, it's a matter of spacing. Um, the particular 
measuring out of space for particular purposes. Um, and likewise, time and timing. And Cedric Price was very clear that every building also has to be designed according to some sense of timing uh, and of uh, specific points of, of, uh, in the future uh, for the, the life of the building. So maybe we can think about photography as a kind of chronometry insofar as we're dealing with uh, the aspects of it that are like a, a measuring instrument and that deal with timing and give some kind of reliable register to uh, that notion. But the larger uh, existential phenomenon of subjective time, our experience of time, seems to me inseparable from things that cannot subsist purely inside the photographic image. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Brian. Uh, okay, we have one more question <clears throat> from Oksana. Uh, thank you. Um, and this is uh, perhaps a comment and maybe we can uh, continue the discussion um, with all the participants of this uh, panel. Um, what, what I would like to ask and to think is um, how visibility and time related, not photography and time, here we, hear, we see very many kind of connections, but visibility and time. And I think the Moybridge is a, an excellent um, example and Chris talked about him and Brian also started with this Moybridge uh, sequencing of um, uh, movement where uh, somehow the, the visibility of still images um, relates to time. So this is my comment um, and perhaps a question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, uh, I, I guess my response is to try to reaffirm the point that I tried to make, although I don't think I was able to illustrate it very well uh, with the examples, that the essential thing that um, is registered in re re visual records that correspond to time is, is not movement. Movement is just one form of change. And there are actually uh, works by John Hilliard in which he did things like record the uh, changes in color in, in photo chem chem uh, pho photochemicals. Um, and, um, you know, you can see this in things like um, uh, certain scientific records of, of mold growing or of, uh, you know, what, watching colours fade and so on. Um, but uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think change is, is the fundamental uh, medium of, of, of the apprehensibility of time. But um, it just happens that movement is the most dramatic and uh, gesturally available um, mode of, reg uh, of time that we can register. I might also add uh, to Brian's comment that to us as humans, time is real. We feel its effects. We, those of you with, with small human beings, <laughs> Children, uh, you you, you vis visibly see times the at least the results of time's passage, and I, I think what's interesting about photography as a piece of visual culture is it promises us a tangible slice of that time, uh, maybe a, a a tiny flirtation with the uh, a, the promise that we might be able to control or possess a small bit of it, and maybe the possibility, the glimmer of hope that that might help quell some of our anxieties over time's passage, which of course I, I think I, I'm maybe a <laughs> prone to be a little of a pessimist over whether photography always delivers that. Um, but I, that's what I think is a visuality or at least an idea of some kind of um, control at least if we can image it, then perhaps we, we have a piece of it or we've bridled a bit of time. Um, I just kind of, you know, well, uh, uh, yeah. Um, actually, as you, as you talk, what it 
what came into my mind was uh, what I think is a fairly familiar experience for Eng English people who go uh, to Latin countries. I mean, certainly in my case in, in Italy, uh, where I found gravestones uh, inset with photographs. And I found this extremely disturbing um, because the, uh, my experience of a, of, a, of a grave monument is that it's an abstraction it's a and you, and you don't expect to see the person themselves there but when you when uh, people set, set photographs in, <laughs> into gravestones it, it it is as if people really want the person to actually be there almost as if you could still see the corpse, except it's not the corpse. Um, and I, I think, um, is it Borowski who, who did uh, a work called The Dead, the Dead Swiss? Uh, does anybody know this work? It, it was a kind of array of photographs he collected of people who, who, who died. Um, there's something worrying about photographs in this respect, because on one hand, they seem to, uh, prima facie, to be better reminders of uh, what has gone than any other. On the other hand, there's something uncanny and creepy about uh, such um, um, ob objects. Uh, they're almost, there's, there's almost too much there. And I think that that would, you know, uh, that would merit a, a really deep uh, psychoanalytical examination. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we still have uh, at least uh, 15 minutes uh, for the dis discussion and we can <clears throat> end uh, later, a bit later. So uh, if somebody wants to ask uh, to all speakers or to Brian in particular. Ah, Boltanski, yes, yeah, not Borowski, sorry. I was, Borowski is a German poet, I think. Boltanski. Yeah, okay. Um, myself, I want to, to, to thank you, uh, Brian, for your uh, excellent papers. I, I, I might be not have a particular questions and uh, or comments right now, but uh, the... the uh, the topic you, you discussed, the intents of time and this uh, works by Graham and uh, Hilliard, uh, it, I, I saw that it's quite close to my personal interest in, in uh, some kind of um, photographic forms as stereoscopic photography or in the slow motion and the contemporary video art or the diff animation where there's still uh, the still image and the moving image at the same time. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how, how I can compare it right now, but I will I will think about your your um, your lecture uh, for a long time, I suppose. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, well, I might have a question if I may. <laughs> if not, anybody, I'm more than happy to leave the floor to anybody else. But what what I've been thinking to all the three lectures actually is um, also that I uh, I think I need to think a little bit more about uh, the difference of the moment of the when the photograph is taken and uh, the moment of when a photograph is looked at because I think these imply two very very different uh, temporalities as well because the one thing is something where you have um, where the the, the uh, where the moment of taking the photograph, which never is a moment, which is never infinitesimally small, but it's always a duration. The photograph has time, but still, it's a cut. It's just like uh, usually, at least, it's some kind of cut. And so, on the one hand, you have this kind of of um, of cut through time, and on the other hand, you have the long time of looking at the image, which, which is something that is completely differs to, um, uh, or at least the long potential time of looking at the image. And I'm trying to 
um, I'm trying to wrap my head ar around the, the question that <coughs> we, we don't see the, the we don't the to, to perceive the time uh, of um, when an image is taken while it is taken is something completely different than perceiving the time or the temporality of an image that we can look at after in the in the uh, in the uh, afterwards uh, it has been taken so uh, it's not really a question as, uh, again but rather a comment uh, but I think most of uh, photographic research uh, at least to what what I know usually privileges again the moment of exposure something I think I said yesterday as well the moment of exposure is the privileged moment the moment the moment of supposedly image production, if we, even if we all know that the that producing a photographic image is a process that goes over time, um, while the moment of looking at images, let's be look at uh, at the lectures in the morning, which uh, to a great deal also dealt with uh, photographic albums, where the performance of looking at images. Uh, was also discussed, but um, yeah, I'm just trying to. Oh, to I think to... I think it's a really a, a, a really worthwhile uh, observation because, um, and it's what I, I think I tried to hint at when I said we we've, we we don't hear enough said about stillness uh, mm -hmm. and our experience of stillness. I think mm -hmm. it's really quite mysterious why we can return to the same image. Uh, you know, maybe day after day if it's pinned on our wall, or maybe uh, yearly or through our lives, we go back to the same paintings, and they're mm -hmm. still there. You leave the room, uh, you come back, there it is, it's still there, uh, still forever uh, waiting to be sustaining, further beholding, further contemplation. I think this is absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. Now, one thing that I tried to spin out of this was an essay that I published in Art Monthly about the uh, the form of or the format of looping with moving images because this has become a very very widespread uh, tool uh, uh, method and it, again I think it came out of minimalism uh, where people were using things like uh, entelechy systems, uh, palindrome systems, A, B, C, C, B, A, A, B, C, C, B, A, A, B, C, C, B, A. And they wanted to find a way of representing some kind of temporal as well as kinetic experience, but primarily temporal, but without the traditional narrative of beginning, middle, end. Uh, mm -hmm. that the, there was some kind of, um, as it were, kinetic equivalence of stillness, um, some uh, durational mode of nowness. Um, you know, that, that, that's a, and I think that these are, have been attempts to somehow uh, represent the, this experience that you've just described of, of the time of, of watching. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that a lot more thought needs to be given to, to the experience, the phenomenology of the experience of, of beholding images. Clearly photographs, uh, you know, from little snaps to major things framed on walls that are now as big as paintings have a huge range. You know, you may have a, a photograph of your beloved just pinned above your computer and it's just a little passport photo and clearly what is, that's completely different from, you know, beholding and contemplating in a graveyard or a museum. Yes. Yeah, thank you. If, um, any of the other speakers of today would like to add something to that? Perhaps I just had a thing about Dan Graham's uh, pavilions because uh, I've made a lot of videos of those. I got fed up of uh, finding pictures of those glass pavilions in all the books and the catalogues in which they were presented simply as objects. You know, you see this kind of beautiful pristine glass thing with st maybe stainless steel glass, stainless steel. And I thought, no, 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 no that's completely wrong. This is not simply a, a sculptural object. Um, they only come alive when people are there. 
And so I, I realized that I had to make um, uh, I had to make videos of people's uh, to try to kind of produce the, a, a true image of what they were. And I said to people, an, a Dan Graham pavilion is not something that you look at, uh, or at least not alone something that you look at. It is something that you look with. It is mm -hmm. an optical instrument. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the camera, the room of the, of the installation is itself uh, an optical recording device. Yeah, and Friedrich, you, okay. you, you used the, the term cut and it, it brings uh, us back to, to the Nancy's uh, paper about Lucerne. And I might be ask, uh, ask one clarification, clarification uh, question to Nancy. Uh, so uh, about the Lucerne's theory, well, uh, am I understand right that uh, he argues that photography is, is uh, are, are not direct, directly uh, perceptible? Uh, so it's, it's kind of illusion that photography is an easy image and uh, we uh, communicate by image that as an universal uh, language, but uh, if I got it right, but does uh, Husserl say something about how we can interpret the images if we consider this virtual nature or uh, mathematic nature of the image, uh, well, how we particular can, uh, can, can see it or can interpret it? Well, it's an excellent question. And I don't know that I can, as I said in the paper, I haven't come to final conclusions about this, but I think it's a negotiation. And depending on who's looking at the photograph, you'll come to it with a very different kind of world that you fill in. I mean, I think I was trying to say that a photograph projects a kind of virtual reality. Frankly, I can't remember how that paper ended. <laughs> but anyway, if it projects a virtual reality, um, the viewers will differ enormously in how, wh what access they have to it. You know, a, a, person looking at an x-ray or a person looking at a medical photograph or something may or may not have the vast store of knowledge that you need to know a lot about what that photograph is doing. Am I getting at your question at all? Uh, well, yes, yeah, but did, did Flusser use some examples maybe how about this perception? Okay, um, well, uh, a family photograph. Okay. That, uh, that was the one that, um, I'm not actually sure what happened at the end of the talk, but if I showed that family photograph, <laughs> it was to say, um, the people who have experienced this family will know a lot about it. And the rest of us will be grasping for things in that image that we can make some sense of, make some associations. Some, but the image in itself, you have to fill in. There have to be, you have to fill in the gaps to make it meaningful. Yeah, I, 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 I think there's, there's always some kind of supplement. Yeah, exactly. I, that, I hope I used that word. I don't actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that Oksana had a question, if I would get her hand up. You have to unmute your microphone, yes. No, once more, it's still muted. Okay. Now, I, I didn't have a question, but just a very short remark. Um, when Brian uh, was speaking about the pavilions, um, I thought it was very interesting uh, that uh, there was a connection uh, with the first talk of yesterday of uh, Ruth when she was speaking about office buildings and how they were uh, sort of conventionally photographed as these objects uh, before they were used and without people and without any uh, lived experience. And uh, this is exactly the difference between the just looking at 
an object and having uh, this much more complex experience of experiencing a certain object. And uh, I think in Winfried's uh, talk, um, there was uh, also a connection to it. So um, it's a really kind of good uh, um, rhymes uh, uh, between different uh, talks. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I just make a, a, an amusing comment here? Um, as, as we're in this, in this conversation, I've just received an email from my friend Christian Grasser in Hamburg. Uh, das Album ist gelandet. Uh, I sent him at his request a photographic album. Uh, he's a video maker in Hamburg and he's been making uh, documentaries about uh, the wartime memories. Uh, of uh, the experience of, 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 of bombing in the war. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to send him a photographic album that was on sale uh, on eBay uh, of uh, RAF crew. And uh, so I, I posted it last week. And uh, as we're speaking, uh, the email arrived. Das Album ist gelandet. Vielen Dank für Organisationen für Schicken. Uh, so <laughs> I think there's something going on here. <laughs> Okay, do we have uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, I, I have rather um, a comment than a question, um, and actually, um, I, I must admit that I can't really think of, or can't really formulate a question, uh, but I really enjoyed uh, Winfried, uh, Winfried's uh, talk um, and uh, uh, something that um, really strikes me there is the idea of this, uh, of the co-presence uh, co and the, com the camera as companion, or maybe the, your only companion on your, uh, on, on something very, um, um, eccentric or some something very dangerous that you do. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I do remember, Winfried, that you did speak uh, of GoPro as being advertised also to families with kids and everything else. But uh, I was thinking of uh, uh, also of Kodak uh, um, at, uh, uh, that a while ago advertised uh, and for a while there um, cameras as uh, um, not not as companions, but also as uh, tools to record uh, the uh, life and uh, the memories to come back to. And I think maybe Gil uh, is uh, here in the audience uh, who did a paper on that, a research on that as well. And um, yeah, so so it's not really a question, but um, yeah, I just I just wanted to comment that I really like the um, the idea of uh, a camera being um, a, a companion, and that the co-presence is not only when we uh, in in what we uh, co-presence the sense of co-presence is not uh, only in how we look at the pic in when we look at the pictures and we imagine ourselves uh, being in the same place as. Uh, whoever made uh, the pictures, but also there is the, the presence, the co-presence of the camera with you. Um, and um, it's sort of like, I don't know, some, some kind of a technical uh, companion to you. And if, if you want to say anything to that, uh, Winfred, um, I, I'd be really happy. I just think I wanted you to talk a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really a complex uh, topic. Uh, because there are so many uh, connections to other technologies and questions, because I, I think that's, that's what I said, the GoPro is maybe not a camera. The GoPro is something which is so connected uh, between or with other technologies like artificial intelligence, like networks, like um, social media and it, it's not like that that you are a producer as as an author of an image but the the environment is and i don't don't think it's only the the nature environment but also also the technology technological 
environment. So it's a that's what I try to to uh, point out that this is a picture of a technological environment which is done by the camera and the people who wear them because they have to decide to wear them. This is <laughs> maybe it's the last decision they they do. I I don't know. It's it's really interesting because there are so many images which are made deliberately by accident. And and it's also somehow connected to body cams of police. If you watch movies of them, it's really interesting how close you are sometimes to those people. You hear, you hear them breathing. And if, if you see them shooting at other people, you are somehow in a strange way connected to a person like that. And that's really a, a big difference. Also, to, to in connection to what we talked about, times and the distance of viewing and making. Because there's another aspect, uh, the images are, are made for um, Verbrauch. Um, use. Yeah, not, not use. It's, um, I, I'm looking for another word. Consumption, Consumption yeah. Yeah, they are more made for, for consumptions uh, and they got lost even after looking at them once. And most of the images, like, I don't know, we have in social med networks, we have like five billion or, or I don't know of, of images a day. So there must be so many images no people ever will ever look at. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a... a, a Complicate, uh, <laughs> complicate situation for images. And the other thing you mentioned, Kodak, uh, and I really found it very interesting that Kodak made a camera which was called Autographer. I don't know if any one of you know the Autographer. It was in the beginning of the 20th century where you can write on the back of the film where the, the image was made. It's like like in the camera, and you could signify it uh, like like with an autograph, like the the people you photograph could write on the film their name. There was an an interesting connection of making images and somehow kind of another kind of indexicality, which which is somehow connected to the sign or the signification of someone else which is a, an early, a early idea of metadata, which is really interesting because a lot of, of those technological connections images today make, I, I would argue are connected to reality via metadata. But that's another, that's really another topic that doesn't have too much to do with the GoPro. But uh, it's an interesting thing that, that you can look on images and there is in digital images there is much more than the image it is it's it's a package of data and it's not only an image so but but that would be really <laughs> something uh, totally different okay. or maybe not i don't know we hope for a lecture at the next, next <laughs> APT about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Matt. Wilfried, maybe just a short question, not question, or maybe a comment. When you had talked about that the nature itself make photographs, I, I was thinking about the popularity of actor network uh, theory in, in contemporary knowledge. So that where the, the ideas the, that the object, the nature, etc., well, uh, um, involved in the different uh, networks and in social reality as well as people do. So, well, if uh, if we have in mind that uh, technologies affect um, uh, our consciousness or our way of thinking, um, well, we could probably say that uh, the GoPro or some other uh, uh, comparable technologies uh, contributed to the emergence of uh, INT or it's somehow connected. Well, that's a, a really difficult question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if ANT ever recognized cameras 
<laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. But uh, to to give an example of something which I didn't talk about is uh, that the GoPro cameras are often been stolen by animals, and animals are filming the 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 people who own the cameras. There's a really very, very funny movie uh, or, or YouTube movie where a squirrel is stealing a camera of a guy who, is, who wanted to feed the squirrel. And then the squirrel is, is running up the tree and is filming the man who's standing down the tree and he's, he's crying, my camera, and where do you go? And, and I think this is a good, uh, I don't know if it's a... Uh, um, it's more than an example, but maybe it shows uh, what these techno technologic technologies could do with us and not we with them. So there's a kind of independence in that kind of technologies. And if you think about uh, how you get in contact with artificial intelligence in these cameras or in smartphones we use today, it would be really interesting to to get into the idea of communication with artificial intelligence, but also that's a, <laughs> that's some something that interests me at the, in the moment a lot, because a lot of the images we look at are not images, photographic images uh, that that we thought of. Uh, when we think of cameras, because most of the images we do with this uh, apparatus is were constructed out of a lot of images which were made in the second you you uh, you press the button, and it's uh, somehow uh, something which is generated by AI and not by optics, and it's uh, an image of Wahrscheinlichkeit uh, probability. But that's also future of the image. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much. And well, that might be a good point to to, to bring to the final to the discussion. Uh, and uh, well, thank you all for great papers and for for the discussion. And well, I. I can give a word to Maria and to Friedrich to, to say some conclusion. Friedrich, go on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I go on. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, we started the conference uh, some in 2015 and uh, I'm doing that annually since then. And uh, uh, I'm shamelessly uh, telling everybody that it is the best conference I ever go. Uh, because it's uh, one of the conferences where I learned so much, and I did. Um, it it is uh, it has been the same this year again, even though we couldn't meet at St. Petersburg as we have done the years before. And so, in conclusion, I couldn't find something which I could say about all the lectures. But what I could say is what I'm taking away from this. And the one thing I think I'm taking away is uh, the notion that we had earlier. Uh, yesterday and that also popped up uh, in some discussions today was that I would I will definitely uh, think a lot more about what uh, yeah what we coined as um, the outside of the image which is metadata which is the context of an image which is like uh, what we uh, what is outside yeah what is outside the image the other thing I'm I'm uh, I will continue thinking about is the um, the the the, question, the whole questions of temporality and as we already discussed uh, a few minutes ago question of temporality both of making images and of looking at images which is also something which is how to say another kind of co presence if you like um, being with images um, and um, the third thing uh, I uh, yeah which is basically actually a project that is going on anyway is um, uh, that I um, once more got demonstrated how important it is to look at many images or to to at least to realize that there are so so 
many images. Winfried already said that there are so many images that nobody looks at. And I think that's one of the fates that of images that is, goes way before uh, digital times and that you could follow back to, I would say, till the early days of mass production of images, which is dates around 1800 uh, with the wood engraving. And so this, um, these, I think, for me, are three points that either got emphasized or uh, got yeah got emphasized in certain respects for me. And so I'm very, very grateful uh, to all speakers and in, in particular to all uh, people who contributed to the discussions. And um, yeah, the usual thing I usually said after, after conferences is that I will never do this conference again. You see what happened uh, over the past time. It, it, it is part of the folklore, I have to say that. Uh, and so I'm saying again, I will never do this conference again. <laughs> you proved me wrong. <laughs> um, I would also use the opportunity to say a very, very big thank you to the translators and their diligent work in translating all the lectures. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not a translator myself only occasion, but it is, uh, I never did that. And it is great work. And I'm very, very grateful for having you and making this conference as possible as an international conference. Um, yeah, that's what my two cents and uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Just wanted to say thank you as well. And uh, it was really exciting. Uh, three days. Um, I'm very happy that this year we did the uh, Emerging Researchers Panel, which was on the 3rd of June, and I think we should keep uh, doing that because it's, um, uh, it's a very interesting format that allows us to see the ongoing research and uh, maybe to have uh, even, even to have some <laughs> influence on it, but mostly it influences us, I think. Um, and I would like uh, to thank uh, my colleagues uh, for um, making this conference happen. Um, Dasha Panayoti is uh, not with us right now, and so uh, is not Natalia Mazur, but uh, Olga Davidova is here, and uh, Dasha Glebova also joined us this year. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Friedrich. I may add two things. The one is that, uh, and that's something Maria can say probably more about, is that the recordings of the conference will be made available uh, via the YouTube channel, I think, of the European University. And I would also invite you to subscribe to the, uh, uh, to the Telegram channel, we uh, to the you know, po after post to repeat Telegram channel, we have, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we have a Telegram, so uh, where we sometimes spread the announcements that there is a new call for papers or similar things like that. We're hoping to see you next conference or the conference after next conference. <laughs> we want to hope to see Nadeshda's uh, daughter as a researcher in 15 years at our conference. <laughs> Tell her. <laughs> okay, see you around. <laughs>